uh, being uh, with us at this uh, webinar. As you see, we're all changing the, the way we work nowadays. And here we are doing a TV chat show, uh, something that we were not prepared to do in the, um, in the medical school. But I hope you will, um, you will stay with us and you will enjoy the show. Uh, I'm very grateful for, uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to Sorana Amuntenci from Yash for organizing this in a very short period of time. We will have some uh, commercial breaks and uh, therefore I'm grateful also to the sponsors. Uh, and with that, I also want to say that we don't have any conflict of interests and all the program, everything that we're going to say is independent from any of the, uh, of the sponsors. So my name, I'm, I'm from Piaz, Romania, but I work in London. My name is Tudor Tom. I'm one of the uh, chess consultants from a large uh, district hospital here in uh, London. And I would like to introduce to you my colleagues and my fellow panelists from, uh, from tonight. We have from uh, Italy, from Florence, we'll have Dr. Ombretta Para, who is an internist in uh, one of the... Uh, major hospitals in Florence, Careggi University Hospital. Also from Florence, uh, there is uh, Marco Trigiani, who is an, uh, a specialist in, in uh, interventional pulmonologist, a chess physician, um, as well in um, Careggi Hospital. And here in uh, England, uh, we have uh, Ta K. Loke, who is one of the chess consultants from Tunbridge Wells, a hospital which is 20 minutes from here, from um, uh, from London. I work in, uh, in Lewisham. Lewisham. Lewisham Hospital is a hospital in southeast uh, London. So without, uh, without spending too much uh, time on, um, on introductions, I would like to, um, I would like to ask Ombreta and Marco to tell us a couple of things about how uh, the COVID situation is in, uh, in Florence. And then we'll discuss a bit with Tuck uh, about the situation in uh, London. So, Ombreta, how, how are you doing and how are things? Good evening, all of you. I'm very glad to be here today. And I thank uh, uh, Tom, Professor Tom for the invitation. Um, I'm an internist and uh, now working uh, in the internal medicine world uh, of Careggi in Florence. And uh, my world has become a COVID unit in these last months. Here we have three typologies of patients afferent from the emergency department. Uh, patients with typical symptoms and COVID-19 positive tests, uh, patients highly suspected waiting for test result, and patients highly suspected after a first negative test. And uh, unfortunately, uh, in these last weeks, uh, there has been a virus spreading uh, into rest ho homes with the elderly people already suffering a lot of other comorbidities and they are very difficult to treat. And this kind of frail patients are the ones we internists are treating every day. So the, this is the, the situation now. Thank you very much. Marco, what, what can you add to, to all this? Uh, good afternoon and thank you for the invitation. I'm Marco Trigiani and I work in uh, interventional pulmonology in Correggi. So as Ombretta, my work is uh, changed in a uh, few days because uh, the increase of uh, number of patients with COVID um, change uh, whole uh, hospital. And um, in my situation, my uh, unit, uh, we perform uh, bronchoscopy and uh, exam only for uh, the emergency and uh, oncologic patient. Um, and uh, the rest of my activity is uh, for COVID. Um, and despite uh, um, the um, um, so uh, the uh, international uh, uh, society don't recommend the uh, performance of bronchoscopy and bala in a patient for the high risk of uh, uh, aerosol production. 
we have a, a position paper uh, of our society uh, that recommend uh, uh, bronchoscopy and BAL in patient with uh, uh, possible CT partner, uh, so one or two area of authority uh, density with a ground cluster and uh, a clinical context uh, uh, highly suggestive for COVID infection or uh, um, BAL to uh, exclude an alternative uh, diagnosis. So um, during the day, I perform uh, two, three uh, BAL uh, for a COVID patient. Thank you, thank you very much. We'll discuss a bit more uh, during the, um, the evening about uh, bronchoscopy and also, of course, about the um, drawn glass changes and ultrasound. I just want to ask Tak, uh, I mean, in London, we've been quite uh, hard uh, hit by, uh, by the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, how, how is it in your place and uh, what has changed in the way you work uh, in your hospital, Tak? Well, thank you very much, Tudor, for the invitation to join this webinar. Um, as uh, you mentioned, I'm a lung specialist or pneumonologist based at a district general hospital in the borough of Kent, which is one of the larger uh, counties in England. Um, and so in London, particularly, um, the, the curve, uh, the surge of cases has very much mirrored that of Italy. Perhaps uh, and nationally, going back about uh, sort of two weeks uh, behind uh, the cases and uh, epidemic in Italy, I think we are, you know, uh, London clearly we have borne the the brunt of uh, activity of hospital admissions and ventilated patients, um, and we've mirrored that with uh, quite a significant number of hospital deaths up to about 22,000 I think mainly in London and major cities um, and this is already an underestimate. The numbers exclude a lot of uh, patients who are in institutionalized settings and care homes. So how have our practice changed? Um, certainly I am not seeing so many patients in the outpatient setting. A lot of our uh, Assessments are done by telephone. We've had to significantly reduce the amount of patients coming for procedures such as bronchoscopy due to aerosol generating risks. And we are triaging all our um, possible cancer patients or patients requiring um, invasive procedures by using swabs and possibly uh, questionnaires and fever charts prior to them coming. So our work has changed significantly from you know, even two months ago, and we're working to a completely different shift uh, because we're mainly respiratory based, and I have a uh, an outpatient as well as an inpatient base of patients with COVID nineteen. Yes. <clears throat> so I think um, there is certainly a lot that uh, has changed in the way we work, and I think the other thing to say is that. Uh, we're also embracing some new techniques on how we uh, try to uh, uh, investigate patients coming to our hospital, either with COVID or other conditions. So um, you are very much closer to the London Sea in Tudor, uh, based in Lewisham, and um, I'd be interested to know how your work has changed as well. Yes, Doug, thank you very much. Um, we changed the, uh, we changed quite a lot because um, initially we had a, a, a small number of patients, but very, very quickly the number of patients uh, increased uh, significantly. And uh, the problem we had was that we could not triage very efficiently the patients based on the uh, PCR testing. Uh, at least for us at the beginning, the PCR result was coming uh, four days later. So it was very difficult to do a triage protocol based on, uh, on the lab testing. And this is where the, um, the ultrasound work uh, came into, into play. 
And it's interesting because uh, before March, for example, like in February, if you would go, or, or in January, if you would go to speak with anyone in um, uh, radiology department and tell them that with the ultrasound you can see interstitial changes, they will laugh at you. You know, they'll say, come on, this is not... Uh, this is not real uh, medicine, but um, since March, uh, the the ultrasound work took off uh, significantly. We got we got funded to have some uh, ultrasound machines. We got some butterfly ultrasounds, and we also got some new um, uh, sonocyte uh, scans. So suddenly, everybody is doing uh, is doing chest ultrasound to to pick up interstitial changes. So um, I think um, I think you point to a, a really new development, which uh, more and more of us are seeing in our practice. And really, uh, I have to say, it also has made a major difference to the way uh, I started to approach patients with possible COVID-19. Um, and I'm sure Umbretta and Marco will share their experiences in uh, in a, a moment or two. But I know you ha and have um, done quite a lot of work around uh, acquiring imagery uh, through the ultrasound scanner. And uh, I'll let you share that data with us now. Yes. So thank you very much. I think uh, the problem with the ultrasound is so operator dependent and this operational dependence is basically related to the way we do image acquisition. So image acquisition is really important in, um, in, uh, in doing uh, um, chest ultrasound, in particular in picking up lesions, which are very small. So I'll, I'll very quickly, I, I think we... We all agree that we will do a bit of a structured uh, PowerPoint presentation just to, st to stay with the old style of, uh, of doing uh, medical presentations. So I have a couple of slides to illustrate uh, some elements about um, uh, image acquisition. This is, um, this is basically uh, bigger London and this is uh, Lewisham uh, where we are. Um, and um, the hospital is uh, serving a population which is about uh, half a million, but we are now joined with Greenwich, and all in all, we'll, we'll probably cover about uh, 900,000 people uh, in, um, in, um, in London. This is the situation in uh, intensive care in South London. This, so this is a, a, a data uh, chart from the network. And you can see that on 23rd of May, for example, there were uh, about 170 patients. And at that time, um, actually before the, uh, the pandemic, the number of uh, intensive care beds we have uh, available in this network are around 150. So we're just about the maximum capacity at that time. And look what happened from 23rd of March until maybe 13th of, or 12th of uh, April, the number uh, of patients in intensive care went from 150. 70 to 450. So basically any, every single uh, ward in the hospital who could uh, um, deliver oxygen uh, was transformed in an intensive care ward. Um, and the increasing capacity, the flexibility in the capacity is impressive. Uh, it did cover the need that we had but um, also we stopped doing any other kind of medicine. So there was no, uh, there was no surgery, nothing else done uh, during this time. And uh, hopefully uh, the numbers are going down. So this is basically the situation in South uh, London. In terms of uh, what we want to do with the ultrasound, um, I think um, with this uh, slide, I want to illustrate what the problem is. So basically you can have a patient with symptoms of COVID, but the X-ray is normal or is looking um, close to normal. So this is uh, an X-ray from one of our patients 
uh, and uh, nobody can say that uh, you can see the lesions on, on this uh, x-ray. So it's difficult to say based on the x-ray only if the patient has COVID or not. This patient uh, had the CT scan, and we know that the CT scan is very good in picking up um, uh, cases even before the PCR result is coming back. But uh, the problem we have in our hospital, we have only one scanner and you need to clean the scanner. It's time consuming. So it's definitely not a possibility, not a practical possibility to, to scan everybody. And on the scan, you see the ground glass changes. So a little bit of ground glass change here, but also a little bit here and a little bit here and here and, and here. Now, ultrasound can pick up changes which are in uh, touch with the, uh, with the periphery. And we know from the case series is from, from China, from Italy, from everybody who, who had patients that most of these lesions are in the periphery. So if you do correctly, if you do this image acquisition correctly, you should be able to pick up even a, a small uh, lesion like this. So where is the difficulty and what is the problem with the, um, with the image acquisition? There are now a number of papers and all the papers are trying to describe a very rigid way of doing this uh, chest ultrasound. Uh, the papers, uh, I mean, if we're talking about the probes, we are using basically the curvilinear, uh, curvilinear probe uh, and very few people are using the cardiac, the sectorial one, and, uh, and the linear probe. So all, all the scans we're doing are mainly with the curvilinear probe. And coming back to the, uh, the protocol, as I uh, mentioned, so papers are trying to say that everything should be uh, very precise, like 12 sectors, 10 sectors, 18 sectors. But uh, in practical terms, it's really, I, I find it quite difficult to go you know, first of all, to remember all the sectors and then to go systematically all the time through all the sectors. So the way we do it, and I'm not saying it is the right way, but it's just the practical way that we're trying to, to, to do the ultrasound to be able to pick up those uh, small lesions are based on, first of all, on um, what is the, on the topographical anatomy of the lung. So we need to remember the um, lobe projections on the uh, on the chest. So if you want to, if you want to scan the right upper lobe, this is where the right upper lobe is, mainly on the anterior part. But if you want to look at the right middle lobe, you should go into the uh, the fifth, the fourth uh, intercostal space around the nipple. So if you remember, if you review and remember this topographical anatomy, then it's quite easy to visualize. What are you scanning when you put the scan uh, in uh, in these areas? Also, remember that the uh, lower lobes are projecting mainly in the back. So if you scan the back, you are actually scanning most of the uh, right or the left uh, lower lobe. The um, uh, approach that we use to um, uh, teach our residents are based, so we, we describe this in a, in a paper which uh, after a, a year of revisions and so on, it has just been published in February 2020. And basically with that paper, we're trying to describe some zones that we need to touch with the ultrasound probe uh, and the the, um, the aim of having these zones in mind is to help us with, uh, uh, with orientation because the problem, the problem for a non-radiologist who is doing point of care ultrasound is disorientation. So basically we describe a zone at the um, uh, margin of the, um, uh, of the chest. Then the zone two would be where you put the stethoscope in the back. And then zone three would be in the safe triangle. Zone four will be in the second, the third uh, intercostal space on the, um, uh, on the anterior part. So basically you go now uh, with your patient either sitting or laying. Uh, most of these patients can be sit, uh, sit up. And then you scan 
in the zone one to orientate yourself, but then to touch all the, you know, to, to, to be able to scan all the areas, you'll need to follow the intercostal spaces. So basically, uh, uh, the scan is, uh, is, is trying to follow the intercostal spaces. So from zone one, you go towards the back. Then once you are in the back, you follow the intercostal space and you go upwards. And then when you go on the um, on the lateral side, on the left side, again, you follow the intercostal space and you go uh, uh, space by space in the um, in the upper uh, towards the upper part. So my point here is, yes, you need to remember these zones. But once you are in a particular zone, then uh, put your probe alongside the intercostal space and try to scan uh, along the intercostal space. Because um, one other capability we need to develop is this capability to see beyond the skin. Yes, if you look at, uh, at this image here, this is basically a, a 3D reconstruction of a patient uh, from a CT scan. And, um, and I'm using it just to illustrate that we have the ribs and all these ribs, although we don't see them when we do the scan, we can feel them and palpation, for example, to feel the ribs and then to keep the probe sliding in this intercostal space will help, uh, will help us to examine more or less the whole surface of, uh, of the lung. And also if the patient takes uh, breaths in and out, so if you ask the patient to take a deep breath in, breathe out, then any bit of lung which is under a rib will move off that rib and eventually you'll be able to pick up uh, even small, uh, small changes uh, uh, on, on the lung. Basically, uh, the step-by-step uh, -step scanning uh, refers to find first the reference organ, then find this curtain sign, which is the artifact suggestive of normal aerated lung, and then focus on the pleural sliding. Uh, because most of, the, uh, most of the COVID changes, as we will see, are based, uh, are changes of the pleural, pleural line and what, what happens when the pleura is sliding. And I will, um, one or two more slides. So this is a, a butterfly image uh, from, um, uh, from uh, one, of, um, one of the patients, just to illustrate the plural sliding. This is the normal uh, sliding, and uh, we'll discuss about the artifacts, but this is how it should look like. And here you will see um, um, an image from, uh, a patient with a tiny change, so small changes subplurally, uh, and those changes will generate this sign, which is described in uh, the most recent Volpicelli paper as the lighthouse sign. Um, and um, as you see, there is an artifact like this one, yes, which is like a lighthouse, light from a lighthouse going around. And that, that artifact would suggest changes of uh, COVID. So in the clinical context, if you pick up this change, immediately you can say that the patient is COVID positive and then therefore you don't need to do a CT scan uh, to clarify the diagnosis. So on that basis, our colleagues from a &E have developed this very nice and practical triage protocol, which is basically based on two elements. One is what you find at this uh, ultrasound scanning, careful ultrasound scanning, and also what the uh, saturation is if you ask the patient to walk around. So if the patient is unwell and the saturation drops with a bit of walking and the ultrasound is positive, then that patient in our view is classified as COVID positive and goes on the red, uh, on the red pathway. Of course, he will have the um, PCR testing, all the other blood testing, but the probability of that patient to be positive is very, is very high. If the patient, however, is um, um, saturations are okay and the focus is negative, the ultrasound is negative, even if that patient has COVID signs, we don't admit that type of patient. We send the patient home 
and we have a, a, a system to monitor them at home using an app, a telephone consultation, and so on. If the patient has alternative findings on, on, uh, on ultrasound, we look for alternative diagnosis. So in this way, we integrated the, um, the ultrasound in a, in a very simple and very practical uh, protocol. And to summarize what I think it's important to remember is, you know, fix, get your transducer or ultrasound, be familiar with that. Uh, use the, we normally use the abdominal setting or the lung settings. Uh, pay attention to how you put the probe on the chest uh, wall and where you put the probe. So pay attention to all these elements of image acquisition, which are really important. Keep a strict protocol according to your practice. It's more like clinical examination. You can cut corners if you want, but uh, you should be experienced and you should have a reason to do that. Otherwise, stay with a strict approach and that will help you with orientation. Uh, there is, of course, variation of the technique and everybody in intensive care, emergency units, other units will tell you that they can do it differently. And of course, the intensity of sampling. So sometimes you don't need to scan the whole chest if you pick up the, uh, the findings. Uh, sometimes you need if you want to, to summarize the lesions. Um, and it really depends on what, you, what, what is the question that you are asking before you do the test uh, and that will uh, that will clarify the intensity of the um, of the scanning so i i think this is this is what i don't know i may have um, again presented a bit too much but that was my uh, my take on uh, on uh, on image acquisition so i don't know for example marco if uh, if you are doing image acquisition or ombreta if you're doing image acquisition in a different way or you are following a more rigid protocol a more artistic protocol um, i'd be interested to know uh, your views on that and of course like we discussed that before uh, together but uh, also your views uh, are are important So um, <clears throat> I think there is a chance for me now to show you what we're doing over in our area. Uh, you will see that I work in a hospital, which is uh, slightly further away from London in the greenery that we see around us. And our population has not seen as perhaps as many um, cases as perhaps our hospitals around uh, where Tudor has worked. But in any case, a lot of our patients are ending up on the intensive care unit with ventilators and triage and assessment of these patients are just as important. So I'm very, very glad that uh, Tudor has been able to provide some very useful and insightful uh, uh, ideas on image acquisition and also some of the images which I think I was going to describe um, which he has done very well. Mm. But let me just start by saying that, um, uh, as you all know, COVID-19 is spreading like wildfire throughout the world, and um, it is unfortunately one that is going to stay with us for the foreseeable future. Um, clinical presentation, uh, we realize now, is not just confined to high fever and dry cough or with or without breathlessness and can be quite variable depending on the age and uh, comorbidity of the patient. We certainly have been seeing LD patients coming in with heart failure and they've swapped uh, positive for COVID and it can present diagnostic uncertainty and uh, ambiguity. As uh, COVID um, Tudor had already mentioned, the um, nasal pharyngeal swaps uh, for RT-PCR are not uh, sensitive enough. Um, it lacks uh, the level of sensitivity which uh, CT can give us. And if we combine CT with RT-PCR, we are able to achieve a much higher sensitivity uh, compared to this CT alone or RT-PCR. But unfortunately, as uh, has been mentioned before, access to CT in many institutions, including in the UK, are very limited due to the concerns regarding transmission uh, and um, other and availability in some hospitals. So what are the advantages of lung ultrasound? I'm sure you're all aware it has uh, 
very uh, good uh, acceptability in that it is non-invasive, can be done by the bedside with uh, minimal or no radiation exposure, which lends itself to serial imaging uh, of uh, our patients uh, and uh, has useful in triage and the disease, disease ass assessment as the condition progresses. However, it is important to bear in mind that uh, clinical findings really have to be correlated with the uh, clinical presentation and um, the use of other imaging modalities such as CT and chest X-ray are still valuable in looking for other pathologies such as pleural fusions and cardiomyopathy. So I want to spend the next few minutes just concentrating on some of the features that uh, we will describe in uh, COVID-19. And Tudor had already uh, mentioned and alluded to some of these key features, but I will mention them again if they've been described uh, by different uh, authors, uh, initially from China, more, more recently from Italy. And um, the key bit about the ultrasound is the fact that we are looking for changes in, um, in plural um, texture and echogenicity, which is the key pathology we find in COVID-19 uh, before the development of other more extensive changes. So in this regard, the loss of curly A-lines, the typical artifact that is seen uh, uh, through the reverberation of ultrasound images from a normal healthy pleura, the loss of these curly A-lines should be seen as uh, the development of some form of lung pathology. Uh, we mentioned about some of the uh, uh, within the curtain sign uh, of lung imaging, uh, the density of lung may uh, create reverberations uh, that are vertical, some, sometimes described as a vertical beam, um, also uh, mentioned as curly B lines, which may either come as confluent patterns or multifocal patterns. And I have some imaging to show you later about how these may appear. But uh, what is clearly important is the, uh, the assessment of plural changes, which can be seen on the ultrasound probe, usually held um, uh, in a parallel configuration to the, the ribs. And what we're looking for are the irregularities and the roughened appearances on the pleural surface that give rise not only to a typical image, but also some artifactual uh, imaging that uh, creates some of the uh, curly B lines. In more extensive disease, obviously, there are changes which uh, can be seen subplurally, uh, which are uh, described and can be correlated with consolidation on CT. Now, in my experience, um, these features can also occur in other pathologies, such as cardiogenic edema, interstitial fibrosis. And so correlation with the patient's clinical presentation is essential uh, because patients do present with multiple comorbidities as well as acute COVID-19. So what I'd like to just uh, spend a few minutes is describing what Savo Picelli has um, uh, been using as a triage assessment. I think this is a piece of work that is shortly to be published and is in currently in press. And he uh, and other workers describe um, uh, various categories, uh, which can go from low probability, which is A, to intermediate probability in C, uh, and then high probability, which is in D, where, uh, and in category B, um, the ultrasound findings are in keeping with some other pathology, so other diseases should be excluded. I mentioned very briefly, as you can see on this slide, uh, typical changes of a healthy lung, which is the uh, determination of regular sliding of the pleura, the presence of 
A lines observed throughout the whole chest and the absence of any significant B lines. Um, with disease progression, there, there is the development of small irregular consolidation within the lung bases, but often without effusion. The development of multiple separated B lines and development of uh, irregular pleural lines. When disease becomes quite uh, significant, um, often there is a patchy and bilateral distribution uh, in multiple cluster areas with coalescent or multifocal B lines. There is still a subplural predominance of uh, disease, and in this regard, um, the ultrasound lends itself to uh, detection of uh, disease, even in the severe, extensive um, uh, lung involvement. Uh, and there is then presence of large spared areas within the lung. Uh, by this stage, one often sees multiple changes of the pleura uh, in terms of irregularity of the line, as well as fragmented lines. There are some images to show you later. What is key uh, and have been reported by many workers in this uh, area is that large lobar consolidation with or without air bronchograms uh, is a rare uh, phenomenon. Um, patients with COVID-19 rarely also present with a large or complex effusions. Uh, and so it is worth just considering uh, if there is another diagnosis or an alternative uh, pathology. So here is an example of a patient I scanned only a few days ago in the intensive care unit. You see that uh, uh, he has got extensive CT changes of ground glass, as well as uh, basal uh, predominant consolidation. Um, and I was interested to see if the ground glass changes uh, could be detected uh, on ultrasound uh, uh, as he was not prone in a ventilation mode. And you can see here the imaging on the ultrasound showing the presence of these uh, vertical lines emanating from the pleura, which are described as um, multifocal curly B lines that are moving with respiration. The patient is on uh, ventilator support. And I mentioned that B lines can be largely uh, classified to uh, either multifocal uh, B lines, and here there's imaging which demonstrates where uh, you get these rays of sunlight coming through and emanating from the pleural surface, demonstrating that the pleura is abnormal. It can, if you look carefully, you will see that there is thickening of the lining of the pleura with some irregularity and some fragmented areas within the, the lining. This is taken with a, with a, um, Butterfly IQ probe, um, and it, the, the probe is orientated parallel to the ribs so that you can appreciate a wider angle of visual vision. Here is my impression of the sort of um, a lighthouse sign that Tudor mentioned with the uh, appearances of uh, light coming through, uh, which changes as the patient goes through the respiratory phase. Uh, lastly, I mentioned pleural irregularities, and it is important when you're systematically evaluating each of the regions to look for normal lung sliding. A smooth pleural line is often best seen with the uh, probe orientated with the axis uh, uh, parallel to the ribs. Here, the imaging demonstrates where there is often thickened irregularity and uh, you see the sort of cobblestone appearance of the pleura as the patient breathes through the respiratory cycle. And um, another very prominent feature in COVID-19 patients is the presence of the discontinuation of the pleural line, which uh, is another example of pathology that we see in this condition. So I'll just, uh, I'm sure there will be much more discussion about the imaging and the types of uh, 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 descriptors that uh, other uh, members of the panel would want to share. So I'll just stop there for the moment. 
Fuck. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll have time for discussions. I'm told, I've told you, this is like a TV show. So we need to take a commercial break now. Uh, so I think uh, the guys in production will put the commercial and then we'll be back uh, in uh, two minutes. Pentru a utiliza inhalatorul Airflux Alphor Spiro, deschideți capacul protector, menținând dispozitivul orientat vertical și descoperiți piesa bucală. Ridicați brațul alb din plastic până când acesta se fixează printr-un click. Reînchideți complet brațul alb prin revenirea în poziția sa originală cu un alt click. Inhalatorul este acum pregătit pentru utilizare. Doza se va administra stând în poziție verticală, cu inhalatorul menținut la nivelul gurii și cu capacul protector poziționat în jos. Relaxați-vă și expirați atât cât vă simțiți confortabil, dar în altă direcție față de inhalator. Poziționați buzele cu fermitate în jurul piesei bucale și inspirați adânc și puternic prin inhalator, nu prin nas. Îndepărtați inhalatorul și țineți-vă respirația între 5 și 10 secunde. Expirați ușor, dar nu în inhalator. Reacoperiți piesa bucală cu capacul protector al inhalatorului până ce acesta este închis. După utilizarea inhalatorului, plătiți gura cu apă. Fereastra transparentă de dozare permite o verificare zilnică a medicației. După fiecare utilizare a inhalatorului, un fragment de blister va apărea în interiorul ferestrei transparente de dozaj. După două inhalări, fragmentele de blister pot fi eliminate, permițând astfel verificarea zilnică. Inhalatorul este prevăzut cu un contor numerotat de la 60 la 0, indicând numărul de doze disponibile. Ultimele 10 doze sunt marcate cu culoarea roșie. Okay, so I'm told we're back live. Uh, we'll move on and I would like to invite Ombreta to share with us some of her uh, experience and also some of her cases uh, where she uh, she's using ultrasound and uh, uh, combining the, uh, the clinical um, aspects with the, um, with the ultrasound in, in COVID uh, patients. So Ombreta, thank you very much for, for uh, taking your time and doing this. Thank you to, to, to do. Um, now we speak about the role of point of care ultrasound evaluation in COVID-19. We know that COVID-19 uh, lung ultrasound patterns are quite typical, but uh, not pathognomonic. And ultrasound imaging of the lung may help inform the clinical decision making for patients with COVID-19 and the management of their um, associated respiratory failure and lung injury. Uh, this facilitated in part by typical sonographic characteristics of COVID-19 associated lung injury during disease progression and recovery. Examination should be conducted to answer a focused clinical question and the procedures should be aligned with the agreed national and local standard. Uh, as Doc has already said, uh, during COVID-19 disease progression, uh, changes in the lung parenchyma begin in the distal region of the lung and progress proximally. There are ground glass opacities and crazy paving changes seen on CT imaging in the early phases and the larger consolidation in the basal lung regions later in the disease course. The areas most frequently affected are the right and the lower lobes, followed by the left upper lobe. As the disease progresses, COVID-19 is associated with the sonographic appearances of pleural line irregularities and B-line artifacts, which are both caused by interstitial thickening and inflammation, and increase in number with severity, uh, with severity of the disease. Uh, small consolidation also increases in frequency and size. In our frail and elderly patients, it's important to integrate different information 
coming from lung ultrasound, which a much more wider vision. Therefore, it may be useful to make a point of care ultrasound evaluation. This kind of evaluation uh, allows to estimate a lot of different parameters at the same time, uh, such as uh, caval index, uh, pulmonary pressure, or left uh, ventricular function. Um, in this patient, it's very important to estimate the true volemic status in uh, a way as pre precise as possible. These patients have uh, one, on one side a relative hypovolemia, uh, because of the hydration, uh, persistent fever, uh, low drinking, and cytokine storm. On the other side, caval dimension can be a range of normality or higher sometimes with high levels of pro-BMP. During non-invasive ventilation, the positive expiratory and pressure uh, increasing uh, of lungs can determine vascular resistances um, because of the compression of alveolar and extraalveolar capillaries, with consequent increase of preload and afterload of right ventricle, shift of right ventricular septum, and resultant of reduction of compliance and left ventricular filling. However, the increase of lungs vascular resistance is opposed with elimination of hypostia inducible. Increased intrathoracic pressure also reduces uh, venous return for right ventricle, especially in real or relative hypovolemia conditions. But this phenomenon is balanced by abdominal pressure increase because of the lowering of the diaphragm. The negative hemodynamic effect of PIP concerns strongly preload dependent patients, and they can be balanced with the preventive volemic feeling. Now let's see a real clinical case. A 69-year-old woman hospitalized with acute heart failure. She has a mitraortic insufficiency and permanent atrial fibrillation. She had a cardiochirurgical surgery recently. She refers dyspnea and asthenia. Nasopharyngeal swab detected SARS-CoV-2. At the left side, we can see chest X-ray shows left pleuroparenchymal opacity and increased pulmonary interstitium. Blood exams show an increasing in all phlogistic markers, such as ferritin and RCP, and high value of diadimer and ProBMP. At the lung ultrasound evaluation, she has a lot of B lines in all fields and she has a moderate pleural effusion in the right side. If we watch with attention the pleural line, uh, we can see that it's irregular. Besides, there are some diffuse subpleural consolidation. And the lower right side video shows a right basal pleural effusion with an area of parenchymal consolidation. In the case of these patients, caval index is quite important. Caval vein is in range of normality with normal respiratory changes. Left ventricular function is chronically mild reduced and pulmonary pressure is normal. About echocardiography and COVID-19, uh, at the moment, there are a few echocardiographic uh, studies uh, specifically conducted on COVID-19 patients. However, the role of echocardiogram in monitoring the biventricular function in sepsis is widely known. An estimated of 30-40% of septic patients in intensive care unit develop a reduction of the ejection fraction of left ventricle a compromission of the systolic function of the left ventricle and the potential compromission of the function of the left section, but it's less typical. The acute myocardial damage accompanied by the significant growth or troponin or ischemic anomalies in ECG results to be associated to an ominous outcome in COVID-19 patients. 
and the prognosis of patients suffering from underlying chronic heart disease without acute myocardial damage uh, results to be relatively favorable. The inflammation could be a potentially determining mechanism for myocardial injuries. I found very interesting this article about the use of echocardiography to guide treatment of novel coronavirus pneumonia. We know four possible heart features during COVID-19 pneumonia. Uh, first of all, an epidemic cardiac function in which there is an increase of cardiac output and the ejection fraction of the left ventricular with or without the decrease of peripheral vascular resistance. This is the cardiac response to systemic inflammation. Then we can also see the acute distress-induced cardiomyopathy, the Takotsubo syndrome, with left ventricular contraction abnormalities and apical ballooning. We also observed a right ventricular enlargement and acute pulmonary hypertension. The increase in pulmonary vascular resistance caused by hypoxia, pulmonary vasospasm, hypercapnia and inflammation, fluid overload, mechanical ventilation, a lot of causes. Finally, diffuse myocardial inhibition due to severe hypoxia, long term of anosia and inflammation. About our clinical case, at last, it's useful to evaluate lower limbs with ultrasound, researching for incidental deep thrombosis. We performed three-point compression ultrasound for the diagnosis of lower extremity deep vein thrombosis. These patients have an higher probability of suffering from thrombotic events caused by a massive uh, phlogistic status and the massive activation of coagulation. Uh, in our patients, we started a diuretic therapy with the furosemidin, maintaining a negative water balance. And at the same time, we started an antiviral therapy for COVID with hydroxychloroquine. We avoid the lopinavir because um, it had a lot of diverse interactions with domiciliary drugs of patients. Uh, such as amiodarone, statins, antipsychotic drugs, uh, in absence of a real benefit on COVID-19. Um, and the patients assume AVK for permanent atrial fibrillation, but during hospitalization, we shift uh, from AVK with the low molecular weight heparin for a possible drug interaction. Uh, this is, uh, in this slide, this is a proposal of the lung ultrasound score. The lung ultrasound score has been shown to be a useful tool in intensive care patients with adult respiratory distress syndrome. An Italian group proposes that this has been of value in assessing severity of lung involvement with COVID-19. Scans of the three different areas on the thorax uh, are performed. Uh, those six specific areas for each lung are defined, defined and categorized by one of four different aeration patterns. A point scoring system is employed by region and ultrasound pattern as zero point in case of elevation of alliance or two or minor of two lines in no more than two areas, one point in case of beliefs in two areas more, three points if beliefs converging in more than two areas or consolidation, three points in case of consolidation and diffuse converging beliefs. Uh, loss of zero is normal and 36 would be the worst. The chest radiography sensibility in COVID-19 reported cases was 59% compared to 86% of the lung CT scan, especially in detecting thin opacities. The real sensibility of the lung ultrasound echography in the situation is not clearly defined. It will depend on different factors, such as operator experience. Uh, a complete lung uh, ultrasound examination should present uh, an intermediate sensibility between the CT scan and the chest radiography. 
uh, an irregular lung B line or a model of consolidation can be observed in any pneumonia or interstitial lung disease. A correlation is absolutely essential. It should be noted that hospitalized supian patients may present lung B lines and consolidation in a posterior and inferior distribution caused by atelectasia. Uh, the lung uh, echography can have the utmost sensibility and specificity, uh, specificity among the heart patients or patients from first aid. The evolution of a focal white lung or a dry lung with widespread subpleural consolidation is index of unfavorable evolution of the pathology with a consequent need uh, for more aggressive treatment with oral tracheal intubation rather than non-invasive ventilation. And the lung ultrasound also allows to verify the potential presence of neutral uh, rocks or new techniques due to bacterial superinfections or pleural effusion. But how we can do the exam? In internal patients with COVID-19, it is necess necessary to make a complete point of care ultrasound evaluation. It's important to scan all chest walls bilaterally starting from dorsal regions with convex or linear rays. Uh, linear probe let us to evaluate firstly eventual subpleural consolidation areas. It's also useful to evaluate heart function with a phase array and measure left and right ventricular systolic function and pulmonary pressure. Besides, it is useful to evaluate caval index with dimension and collapsibility. At last, it's useful to evaluate lower limbs with ultrasound researching for incidental deep thrombosis. And it's fundamental to integrate the uh, ultrasound evaluation with the lab test, in particular index of phlogosis coagulation parameters and anti probian p values. This is a proposal of point of care evaluation in COVID-19. It's necessary to integrate information coming from thoracic ultrasound by recognizing the different possible patterns, uh, evaluating the presence of B lines, their quantity, the characteristics of the pleural line, and the possible presence of subpleural consolidation. Evaluate some simple echocardiographic parameters, such as left and right ventricular function and pulmonary pressure and then a cover dimension to regulate the patient's water balance and monitor him over time. Evaluate the veins of the lower limbs by ultrasound so as to discover early the presence of deep vein thrombosis. Finally, ultrasound information must be integrated with the clinical and the laboratory test. So we can conclude that in internal patients with COVID-19, it's necessary to make a complete point of care ultrasound evaluation. It's important to scale all chest walls bilaterally, starting from dorsal regions. Linear rays allows to evaluate firstly eventual subpleural consolidation areas. And it's also useful to evaluate heart functions with a cardiologic probe. Besides, it's useful to evaluate caval index with dimension and collapsibility. At last, it's useful to evaluate lower limbs with ultrasound and integrate uh, clinical, laboratory, and the radiological approach with ultrasound at the patient's bedside is fundamental for the diagnosis, the monitoring, and the evaluation of the therapy for the patients suffering from severe COVID-19 pneumonia. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andretta. Um, while uh, Marco is getting ready his presentation, can I uh, ask you, so what is your experience? Do you see a lot of pleural effusions in patients with COVID uh, on ultrasound? Or uh, if you see a pleural effusion, you have to think of, uh, of a second uh, pathology? I think uh, that are secondary pathology, especially in patients with heart failure. Uh, in young patients, um, no, 
I don't find found a lot of uh, pleural effusion. But in elderly, in elderly patients with heart failure, mm. I think it's uh, it's concomitant disease. Okay, thanks a lot, Marco. What do you think about the uh, pleural effusions? Oh, yes, pleural effusion uh, is an important aspect to consider in this patient. Uh, I think there is not a large effusion uh, as uh, in uh, the patient, uh, uh, air failure patient or an aplastic patient. But the, um, the research of minimal pleural effusion uh, can uh, be useful in this uh, kind of uh, infection to discriminate the, uh, the COVID patient, the partner of a COVID patient. Okay, so I think to be able to see Marco's presentation, Ombretta needs to switch off her uh, share screen. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. Well. Whilst that's happening, I just want to ask a question because <clears throat> I'm fascinated by the extent of uh, use of the ultrasound in the uh, very sick patient. And one of the interesting things is about perhaps picking up pulmonary embolism. I know we have the Doppler ultrasound for the venous thrombosis. <coughs> but I certainly think, uh, I have certainly seen some surrogate uh, changes with atelectasis uh, on an ultrasound that subsequently uh, was confirmed on CT pulmonary angiogram as having pulmonary embolism. I just wonder whether anyone had any thoughts about it. Mm, Marco. Uh, just a moment, I have a problem to share my Pul presentation. Pulmonary embolism is a real uh, diagnostic problem in these patients. And uh, I think it should be suspected in patients who acutely uh, worsen the respiratory pattern and in whom uh, didymer values are quite tight but not in agreement with the uh, inflammatory marker and systemic uh, inflammatory st status. I think that is a real, uh, real problem. Using the um, inflammatory markers as well as clinical uh, progression to tell you about a change in uh, investigations. That is what we do as well. We had uh, at the beginning, for example, when we were seeing uh, green patients and red patients, uh, one of my colleagues were, was on the green patients, so basically COVID negative patients. And I've asked him, so what, uh, what pathology are you seeing on the green line? And he told me, well, uh, we saw a pulmonary embolism uh, on, the, <laughs> on the green line. And then I said, come on, let's have a look at the scans. So when, you look at the, when we looked at that patient scan, the, um, um, uh, the embolism was clear, but he also had peripheral changes suggestive of COVID. And that was one of the first patients we, we had with, uh, with COVID and pulmonary embolism, which, which sort of uh, uh, opened, opened our eyes that a lot of these patients can have uh, thrombosis. So I think uh, Marco is, uh, is ready to roll. Yes, uh, sorry for the technical problem. No, I mean, you know, this is live TV. What, yes, yes. <laughs> what do you want? Okay, and uh, we'll, um, we'll watch your presentation, Marco. Okay, so the first uh, Italian COVID focus uh, was recorded in Codogno and uh, is followed by rapid diffusion in the region of northern uh, Italy, particularly in uh, Lombardy, uh, as uh, we know. The uncontrolled increase in infected patients at the median age of over 70 years has led to rapid collapse of the hospital structures and the increase in death. So, to stop uh, this medical emergency, and try to block uh, the spread of the virus, uh, the lockdown uh, uh, was imposed. Uh, after about uh, three or four weeks, uh, we have uh, a stabilization of the COVID uh, positive curve, and now we can observe a gradual uh, reduction in death and a marked increase in the number of uh, these children. Um, the effect of lockdown have limited the fusion uh, to the central southern regions, 
these uh, graphs show the huge uh, discrepancy of COVID pattern between uh, two of the most affected regions, Lombardia and Toscana, confirming the trend between the death and the uh, yield. Another important uh, aspect uh, concerns the difference between uh, the city in the same region. But I think uh, that the mortality rate uh, uh, is the aspect more important. Uh, uh, mortality rate uh, was uh, three, four times higher uh, if you compare to the same period with the previous uh, five uh, years. Uh, um, recent uh, survey conducted by the Academy of Thoracic uh, Ultrasound uh, show how the uh, more involvement region are the same in which thoracic ultrasound is more uh, widespread accessible and uh, apply both for the study of the pleura and lung uh, disease. This um, random uh, combination uh, allowed to acquire important uh, data regarding uh, uh, the use of ultrasound uh, in COVID patient. But uh, uh, why ultrasound and what uh, do we know? Um, we know that the uh, coronavirus is a high contagiousness infection, um, can cause uh, a viral pneumonia. There is a, a, a right, uh, high risk uh, to move a stable infected patient uh, uh, from the um, uh, intensive care unit or internal unit. Uh, so perform chest uh, CT is uh, a limited option. But uh, we know that the ultrasound gives the results that, that are similar to chest CC and superior to standard chest X-ray. And uh, also ultrasound can be used in the diagnosis and management of pneumonia and uh, adult respiratory stress syndrome. And also can be easily repeated at the bedside without exposing patient to radiation. So, um, ultrasound can be used as an instrument to monitoring uh, this uh, kind of disease um, because uh, uh, ultrasound can be used to study the posterior lung field that are mainly in increase or uh, a decrease or converge to a white lung. At the ultrasound, the pleura line appears smooth, discontinuous, and uh, interrupted due to the pleural lesion or pleural fusion around the same. And uh, finally, uh, we can observe consolidation, uh, usually with a bronchogram sign. So, which ultrasound we are able uh, to evaluate in and monitoring uh, the progression of lung dermi? which usually evolve from uh, in, uh, an uh, interstitial uh, uh, syndrome to ARDS or consolidative form. And also uh, we are able to change in the, the, the timing and therapeutic uh, option. But the ultrasound, uh, uh, with ultrasound, we are able to uh, evaluate the efficacy and the treatment and the resolution of pathological signs. So ultra, uh, ultrasound can be used uh, to evaluate the uh, recruitment uh, line consolidation and uh, assess the efficacy of ventilation, as you should, can see in this uh, uh, video. Ultrasound can be used to assess the efficacy PEP for recruitment. And more important, in patient uh, intubated and ventilated, you can use uh, ultrasound to evaluate the, the effect of postural recruitment in uh, before and after treatment. I want to speak about uh, this case, uh, 75 year old uh, woman affected by hypertension in pharmacological treatment. No history of cancer, smoke, metabolic disorder, or other. Uh, the patient uh, was uh, hospitalized for stroke uh, with loss of consciousness and the chest trauma. When arriving in the emergency room, uh, the parameter as uh, the other one. So, we perform brain CT 
that confirm ischemic area in the left temporal lobe, and uh, chest CC uh, that show bilateral interstitial alteration and the right pleural effusion. This pattern uh, was interpreted as uh, uh, secondary to hair dysfunction. The patient was intubated and treated with uh, vascular thrombolysis and after a uh, 48 hour of uh, stability, uh, the oral tracheal tube was removed and the patient breath uh, spontaneously only with uh, uh, oxygen support. But after uh, three hours, uh, we observe a worsening of the respiratory function with uh, acute failure as uh, confirmed by, uh, by uh, Imugas. And uh, so the patient was intubated and ventilated. And after 24 hours, we can see a psychotangus emphysema. Chest CT confirms subcutaneous emphysema, but show mediastinal emphysema, suspect bilateral interstitial alteration, bilateral pleural fusion, basal left consolidation, and tracheal laceration. So a damage uh, during uh, uh, intubation. Um, before uh, uh, perform bronchoscopy, uh, we perform ultrasound that confirm uh, lung uh, left consolidation, uh, bilateral infusion, and uh, uh, abnormal uh, uh, partner uh, with uh, increase uh, the number uh, of B lines. Bronchoscopy uh, confirm laceration of the pars membranacea will stand for five centimeters up the carina and the mediastinal communication, but not a uh, sign of a fistula with uh, esophago. We perform uh, broncholavage and uh, surprise, the patient was uh, COVID positive. So I think that uh, the partner uh, out, uh, after ultrasound uh, can be pathognomonic for the infection. The patient was transferred to intensive care unit, uh, proposed for uh, COVID patient, and the problem was how to control uh, the evolution. We perform a compare chest ultrasound and uh, X-ray. Um, also, uh, a chest ultrasound, a chest, a chest ultrasound, a chest X-ray confirm resolution of uh, the bilateral effusion and the reduction of left consolidation but only chest ultrasound confirmed the resolution of B-line at the end of the illness. So I think that... ...reduction of mesthetial partner to monitoring the line consolidation, to uh, close monitoring uh, the pro, uh, to program intubation, to monitoring the uh, of pronation benefit and equipment in the intubated patient, and monitoring clinical evolution. But also can be helpful to evaluate the complication of some procedure, uh, as uh, when uh, we put a uh, CBC or use uh, high PEP, and uh, in the management of other possible internal problems. Uh, I think that uh, um, the thoracic uh, um, ultrasound can be performed uh, to integrate the information provided by clinical sign and symptoms, but this requires the knowledge of the basic semiology of the ultrasound and the acquisition of specific competence. Uh, we write uh, one year ago uh, paper for uh, standardized uh, the competence in thoracic ultrasound. In Italy, uh, we have a different group uh, and of thoracic ultrasound and uh, second level uh, university and master who organize a theoretical and practical course for uh, the acquisition of the uh, competence, who share online images and discuss clinical case, produce a scientific article and book, and also propose a paper opinion as in uh, uh, the case of COVID, COVID uh, in uh, pandemic. So uh, take home message uh, in my opinion is uh, that COVID and the ultrasound, I think this wedding is to be done.
but without competence and experience, we, have, uh, we can have a, a surprise. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Marco. Uh, we're going, we have uh, on this chat, there are a lot of questions coming in. Uh, I think uh, in order to be able to pay for the internet, we need to take another commercial break and we'll come back in two or three minutes uh, with, the, uh, with the live questions. Okay, so I think we're live again, and we have now time to take some um, uh, some questions. The questions are coming on the um, on the chat, and um, I will go in no particular order. But um, for example, because uh, Marco, you you uh, presented last, uh, there is a question here: Do you do transbronchial biopsies and um, um, is there any indication to do transbronchial biopsies for, for the COVID diagnosis? Okay, um, I don't perform a transbronchial biopsy. Um, in Italy, uh, only one center uh, perform a, a transbronchial biopsy for uh, research. But uh, I think uh, that uh, biopsy don't give uh, uh, more in the diagnosis of uh, this patient. I think that the uh, problem is in the future, uh, the complication of, of uh, this kind of infection. Uh, and so uh, if uh, there is a, a predisposition to pulmonary fibrosis in the future in this patient. So 
uh, biopsy at this moment can be uh, studied uh, as a, a predict marker uh, if you he, if he can uh, observe uh, pulmonary fibrosis in the future. Thank you very much. Um, the next question may be on I can, uh, can say something about that. So you mentioned hydroxychloroquine for the, uh, for the treatment, but what about azithromycin? So the question here is uh, uh, if you are using azithromycin and why is this the only antibiotic used? Why not other antibiotics? In elderly patients uh, uh, with a lot of comorbidities, we prefer to use uh, using azithromycin with hydroxychloroquine because uh, lupinavir, ritonavir has a lot of um, collateral effects and a lot of inter interactions with uh, some important drugs uh, such as statins, uh, beta blocker, uh, amiodarone, a lot of uh, a lot of drugs. So, and the um, real effective of antiviral therapy with lupinavir, ritonavir uh, are uncertain today. So we, we use uh, or hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin for, um, for domiciliary treatment in Italy, for example, uh, because uh, uh, azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine uh, have a um, um, minor effect on uh, QT, on HCG, uh, for example, respect uh, lupinavir and hydroxychloroquine, for example. Thank you very much. Um, Omrata, you said you have to go to work. Uh, yeah. So if, if you have to leave, uh, we thank you very much and we'll carry on answering some more questions. But grazie uh, mille. Uh, thank you, see you. Yes, thank you. And so the next question is, I'll, um, I'll pass that to Tak because uh, they are asking how long it takes to perform a chest ultrasound in a COVID patient and what about left ventricular failure and stasis? Is there any, do, do you see any difference uh, in interstitial changes and what, what is your view, Tak? Well, I think, you know, there, uh, the, the protocols for image acquisition um, are still developing and um, Tudor has already alluded to one, but there is many other different ways and uh, standardized chest assessments can depend on the operator experience as well as, you know, the uh, you know, the context of the patient, if the patient is actually, you know, unconscious or semi-prone, um, you know, may take much longer. So I think timing is not as important as um, proper image acquisition. I do think that there is some uh, advantage, and I certainly have been doing that, uh, but if you have the ultrasound probe, which is set to a, um, uh, a, a sort of abdominal, uh, uh, image acquisition, you can get pretty good views of the heart at the same time and as, as the IVC filling and um, it wouldn't take uh, more than a few minutes to include that, that sort of image acquisition as part of your assessment of a patient uh, who may have uh, cardiogenic edema. Um, it's very particularly important in our comorbid patients who are elderly who have coexisting cardiac disease because um, in my opinion, um, the uh, institutional changes that you see in COVID-19 uh, may be quite similar to what you might see in interstitial edema, and you do need to have some form of cardiac correlation to be able to um, uh, exclude significant uh, cardiomyopathy. Thank you, Tak. I'll uh, take the next question because it's from a colleague from Yash, and they are talking about, uh, they are saying in Yash is taking so Yash is my hometown. Yes, yeah, so it's taking 24 hours to get the PCR result. And they're asking how, uh, where are you placing the patient or how, uh, how should you solve the patient placement problem, especially if you have four days to wait for, for the result. So in, in our case, um, the, um, the a and &E doctor, so the doctor in emergency, would go in the ambulance with the um, uh, with the butterfly ultrasound. Will scan the patient in the ambulance, and if there are signs of COVID, that patient would be considered COVID positive until proven otherwise. 
So the patients might be put into a uh, red uh, ward uh, only on the basis of the ultrasound and then wait for the, uh, for the PCR result to come back. I think Yash is a bit fortunate to have the results back in 24 hours. They, uh, they managed to, to, to do the, the uh, PCR uh, quicker in, uh, in our hospital as well. But um, with the ultrasound, you have the results in five minutes. So you don't need to wait for the uh, PCR. And if you are in doubt, you may do a CT scan. So let's see um, uh, who, who can answer this question. Can ultrasound differentiate between ground glass and crazy paving? Tak, you are smiling. Um, I took a picture of a patient uh, with ground glass, and I think uh, ground glass can certainly be um, detected on ultrasound uh, in a quite sensitive way. Um, I think it's difficult at this stage because I don't think anyone has specifically evaluated CT and uh, ultrasound uh, findings uh, and correlated them. I think this is an area of research which will develop um, as we develop more experience about, uh, you know, survivors of, uh, of, of um, COVID-19. Another interesting question here, uh, which I'll actually pass to Marco, is uh, related to pneumomediastinum in non-ventilated patients. Actually, we had some uh, a &E patients, so we've seen patients with uh, uh, pneumomediastinum without being ventilated just before being put on a ventilator. And the question is, what is the, uh, the explanation? What do you think the mechanism is? Marco? Uh, um, I don't see in COVID patient uh, uh, mediastinal uh, uh, expression, but uh, I think um, uh, can be an um, individual uh, uh, alteration uh, that predisposes the patient to this kind of uh, problem. I think the... Um, yeah, I think you're yeah. right. Sorry? I think you're right. So it may be the, uh, the, uh, the tissue. But I can also tell you from my personal perspective, the problem is the cough. So the cough is such a horrible cough. And sometimes I think the pressures you generate with that cough will, uh, might, might lead to, uh, to a degree of pneumomediastinum, like, like asthmatics yeah. will, uh, will end up uh, having. Uh, so of course you need to, you know, you need to have the right, uh, the right material in inverted commas uh, to, yes. to end up with that. Okay, I think uh, we have time for one or more, one or two more questions. The questions are uh, uh, interesting. So somebody is asking if you can do ultrasound evaluation for lung cancer patients. Um, what, uh, Marco, what happened with the, with the lung cancer patients in, uh, in Carregi, in Florence? Uh, are you still seeing a lot of lung cancer patients or they, they are uh, shielded? They are away. Um, there is a reduction uh, of uh, cancer patients because the um, lung unit uh, have reduced uh, the, um, the activity. So we can not observe uh, many patients, only uh, patient with uh, an um, emergency to perform the angiosis. And uh, also oncologists uh, stop the treatment in this patient uh, and uh, this is a very um, problem. So I will just add very quickly that uh, uh, um, um, don't have the all diagnostic uh, uh, access. Okay. That's to um, what's happening in Italy and UK. A lot of uh, cancer services have had to step back and a lot of patients are not going to their primary care physician 
So you can pick up lung cancer um, on the ultrasound if you have the uh, consequences of lung cancer, such as a pleural effusion or even a, a, a large mass with consolidation or collapse. But um, I don't think we have started to use. I mean, traditionally, we have used ultrasound for the detection of large malignant effusions, haven't we? And now we've expanded our ultrasound skills to look for interstitial edema and interstitial fibrosis, which is a development. Okay, one more question and then we'll, uh, we'll finish. Uh, I think this is interesting as well. So anyone has any experience with Doppler images uh, in the lung? And what is your experience with the pregnant, uh, pregnant patients and, uh, and COVID? So Tuck, any, anything you want to say? And then I'll ask Marco and we'll wrap up. Uh, no, I don't have anything to say. Uh, I think, you know, uh, a lot of our assessments of COVID are on pregnant women are just based on clinical findings. Um, and I don't have experience on the Doppler on, uh, on these patients. Uh, so I, I don't know. Uh... Okay, I thought we would end uh, in, a, in a more optimistic uh, um, view, but uh, this is this is all the time we had to uh, we have for 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 this uh, webinar. Uh, once again, I'm I'm very grateful to Sorana Amunpenchi in Yash for organizing all this. I'm also grateful to the sponsors who allowed us to have the uh, internet connection. And uh, very many thanks uh, to Marco, to Ombreta, to Tak for taking time uh, from work and from your family to, uh, to have this discussion. Um, as you see, we're all learning with this Zoom and, uh, and webinar. I hope uh, it was uh, okay and clear. If there are any mistakes, I apologize for them. Uh, but uh, I enjoyed very much the, uh, the discussion and the, um, uh, the dialogue. And uh, once again, many thanks and thank you for, uh, for staying with us. Thank you for sharing. Very enjoyable. Nice chair. Thank you very much, Tudor. Thank you.